Hey, hello. Welcome back to the, the trading, trading desk. desk. Hey. Hi everyone. Welcome back to the Watch Insider. My name is Brian and thanks for logging on. And we are back to watch us tonight here on Watchbox Studios. Just kind of get an idea for what the market is currently and what pieces are hot. Right. But um, basically one is gonna be something that you can put your money into now and you're relatively safe, right? So the market's pretty much set on the watch. You're maintaining a, a steady, you know, baseline and you're gonna hold, you know, you're gonna hold price in the watch. The other one is gonna be something that you is way under market but you get a lot for your money, right. a lot of bang for the buck. So, okay, so yeah, you're getting at the right in the right direction. So in this context, what we're gonna talk about today is watches that hold value we're talking about in relation to their MSRP, and that's really where things start, right? So right. the brands, they're gonna set an MSRP, and then, so if you go and, if you have to go buy that watch at an MSRP level, brand new, um, is that watch gonna hold value pre-owned or is it going to lose value pre-owned? So, when we talk about watches that hold value, it's in regards to their MSRP, their manufacturer their retail, suggested correct. retail, right? The retail price. Watches that are value plays are watches that pre-owned sell for well below fifty percent or under, I right? Would say. Well below their their MSRP. So, um, questions when a customer comes to me and says, "Hey, what's a great chronograph to buy?" Right. So, first number one is always, "What do you like?" Okay. But say they say, "I like everything." Okay, fantastic. So then at that point, th we're talking about price points, and then we're talking about value retention is that is that important to you when you're buying a pre-owned watch right so some chronographs that hold value in regards to their msrp and listen this is this really should be a no-brainer but we can talk about it it's going to be say like a stainless steel daytona right now the retail price on that is what 12.4 yes okay if you're buying that watch pre-owned used how much are you paying jay 20 grand yeah right. so you're paying 18 to twenty thousand dollars depending on age condition and dial color right. for a steel chronograph from rolex Okay, so that watch is going to sell almost double the original retail. So that's a watch that holds value. Sure. If you buy it pre-owned, is that a value play though? No. That's not a value play. So now you're paying $20,000 for a stainless steel Rolex chronograph. Exactly. Right. So is that, that's the difference that we're talking so, about here. Right. There's a handful of watches, you know, that could be examples of both. Mm -hmm. Right. So obviously that watch... Uh, Silver Snoopy, yeah. AP, Chronographs. There's mm -hmm. watches right now that sell over retail where if you buy the watch at retail, you're safe and, and you're holding value. Mm -hmm. And if you're chasing the secondary market and you're willing to pay secondary pricing, then you know, you're know you you're going to take a bath. Right. So, so. It's not, so even though the watches hold a tremendous amount of value today, they might not be a great value for your money. Right. Primary feature tonight, why only Vacheron Constantin can save yellow gold. I thought this over, and just as we've kind of touted the advantages of white metals, we need to look at the most traditional of golds and whether it's got a shot at coming back. And right now, yellow gold and Vacheron are both on the mat. I don't think they're out for the count, and they're intimately connected. So here's how it goes. The status of Patek, Vacheron, and AP is beyond question. The so-called holy trinity of Swiss horology has never had so many rivals to manage, but the allure of each brand remains undeniable even in the era of Longa and the Seiko Grand Seiko Crador Micro Artist Studio. Now among the stalwarts of the trade, only Vacheron Constantin's hitched pretty much its entire image and catalog to dress watches, and this is important. The overseas might be the most impressive oversized haute de gamme sports watch in its category, but it has never come to define Vacheron the way the Royal Oaks and the Offshores define AP, and the Nautilus and the Aquanaut even today define Patek. So here's why Vacheron is the best standard bearer for a yellow gold resurgence. Start with the fact that the brand is all about dress watches, and that's where yellow gold is really going to find its way back to popularity. So Others really have no more room for yellow gold. Rolex, you guys have done yeoman duty. You've done your part. You never slacked off. You never discontinued yellow gold. Like Eddie Van Halen in the 90s, he never ditched solos so the music would sell. Rolex never ditched yellow gold. Doing all it can with the yellow gold GMT, the Submariner, and the Daytona. And not just the Daytona, but the cool one with the ceramic bezel on the Oyster Flex. Rolex is not going to make any more watches, and it's not going to crank up production because it has untenable discipline for a commercial enterprise. So we're not going to get any more from Rolex than we already are. Okay, Patek and AP are maxing out their steel sports watches right now. 
I can't say for a fact that AP is transferring some proportion of its 40,000 watches a year beyond its norm to the Royal Oak in the offshore, but I can tell you that just about everything at SIHH this year was a Royal Oak of some description, most of them in steel. AP has made its bed, and it's not with yellow gold. Those watches have never and will never sell in yellow gold. And we'll, read, we'll address in a moment why AP's Royal Oaks in yellow gold have not delivered the goods. Um, also, Patek and AP are maxing out their production. Both have announced that their production is fixed for the ne next couple of years. AP is making about 40,000 watches a year. Patek is somewhere between 50 and 60. Like Rolex, they have the discipline to pick a number and stick with it. So we're not going to see a greater proportion of yellow gold because steel is what's making the money right now. And in this cyclical industry, they have to make hay while the sun shines. And frankly, their steel models are their strongest play. So uh, here we have a, you know, a beast of a watch. This is a Lang & Son Richard Lang Pourlin Marie Tourbillon. So this is actually the first of its kind that we've had uh, pre-owned, uh, you know, sort of, you know, uh, ever. Um, so what's so amazing about this watch, you've got a 41.9 millimeter watch, so it's got a great size to it. Platinum, sorry, is it white gold or platinum? White gold. So it's a white gold case, uh, silver dial, uh, you know, fusée chain, with a very cool dial complication that Tim here will present to you. And I am sure that he's going to go into far, the far more specifics of this watch than I just have. And then we can talk a little bit more about the market of this watch after he's done. I was just going to say it's damn cool. No, I, I kid. Pour le Marit, if uh, you're a long connoisseur, you know what it means. If you're not, it always means not a tourbillon, not a complication, but the presence of a fusée and chain. This is one of two constant force devices used by Longa. The other is the remontoire in the Zeitwerk. Here you can see that there's a fusée and there's a barrel, and there's a chain made of 636 individual parts connecting the two. Now, they're both shaped effectively like the gears of a bicycle, and the conical fusée and chain profile allows the chain to pull a bigger and bigger circumference to reduce the amount of physical effort and increase the torque as the mainspring barrel runs down, the gear ratio effectively changes, as on a bike. So as you have less force in the mainspring barrel, the fusée imparts greater mechanical advantage by acting as a conical ramp. And eventually, you'll wind up with all of the chain on one or the other as you wind and discharge the movement. It takes a ton of power, and there's not much space in the movement, so it has a 36-hour power reserve. Now, this is the caliber L072, which means work started in 2007 per the Longa nomenclature. You'll note it is beautifully open in a way that many Longa calibers are not. You can see clean through the movement. And this is an exciting piece because the fusée and chain works in tandem with not just a tourbillon, but one of the few tourbillon regulators you'll ever see that has a stop seconds feature. That's right, the tourbillon hacks. Get our focus back. Now, what really sets this watch apart is that there's a level of dynamism that you would not expect in a fusée watch. They tend to be intellectually appealing and fun to wind as you watch the chain, but you don't expect... Boom, there it is. Exactly. How awesome is that? If you can That's a cool little quirk for Lang. That is awesome because it gives you full view of the tourbillon, except when you need the remainder of the dial. And it disappears just as quickly. It's a switchblade for your wrist. Longa, I love you. Some chronographs that will that don't hold a lot of value, but our value play would be something like a Brigade Type 20. Right, sure. Or Type 22, or now, yeah, the, they're on the Type 22. So, a fantastic manufacturer, well made watch, and you're going to buy it pre owned well below the MSRP. Um, another one, Vacheron. So, uh, the second gen Vacheron overseas chrono is a tremendous value play. So, if you have $20,000 to spend, you can go buy yourself a Daytona, uh, a white dial Daytona, ceramic Daytona. Right, or you could buy yourself a, a white dial um, a Royal Oak, or sorry, a, a overseas chrono, and then have another eight or ten thousand dollars left in your pocket. So that that shows the difference. Sure. So um, what are other, say, stainless chronos that you would say are value plays? So if guys are thinking to themselves, well, you know what, I want to get a good value for my money, right? Yeah. Hot, accessible watches that are value play in a steel chrono. Right? For me, I mean, uh, first thing that comes to mind, you got to say. Uh, this the regular Speedmaster zero zero five is probably the best, yeah. hands down the best bang for the buck. What you're sure. gonna put money in and get money out, 
because you can own that watch for a couple years, trade out of it for pretty much what you put into it. Yeah. And it's a manual wind, 42 millimeters. You know, uh, if you get the 006, it's Sapphire. The, obviously, the 05 Sapphire is Hesolite. Yeah. But either watch is cool um, with the Hesolite being a little more traditional. But for, you know, let's call it three grand or right. sub three grand. Well, it's a 5250 um, retail. Right. But so you're, watch, gonna, you're not going to pay full retail for them if you buy them pre owned. But also, so what, so what you're saying, and actually makes a lot of sense, is that if you buy. Uh, somewhat lower dollar in regards, like in relation to what you know, the full market, right? So you can exactly. spend ten thousand dollars. It might not be super easy to get out of a ten thousand dollar watch privately and get all your money, get full market. But a Speedmaster, those sell constantly. You can sell it on eBay. Right. You can sell it on a forum. You can sell it on Craigslist. Relatively easy with with a low amount of risk. So that is a fantastic, uh, uh, a, a fantastic value play that you don't have to sell them to somebody like us. Right, because there's there's not it's it's going to be constant demand for the piece. constant demand for it. There's a lot of people who can afford it, right? So that's a fantastic steel chronograph that you can buy, wear for a while and get out for roughly what you paid for if you buy right. it pre-owned, right? If you buy it right and you sell it right, you can wear it for two years. So that's the perfect take, example you know, of a value play, loss. right? Exactly. exactly. Why don't we get started with the, uh, you know, the granddaddy of these pieces here? Yes, of course. I'm going to go with my. I'm not going to say this is my favorite on the table because I've got a lot of interest in these watches and emotional connection, but this is easily the oldest reference on the table. Back in 1991, IWC started selling its first wristwatch Grand Complications. This is the reference 3770, and it's a Grand Complication in the 19th century sense, which is to say it has a conventional chronograph, a minute repeater, and a perpetual calendar. Back in the pocket watch era, this is what a Grand Complication was. Today, obviously, we have unreasonable expectations for complication-dense watches, but back then, if you were getting a Grand Comp, you were getting a minute repeater, a perpetual calendar, and your chronograph was probably going to be a conventional chronograph. All of that said, and I am going to sound off this watch, so don't worry, the most visually spectacular piece is something IWC was doing in the 90s and which I adore. It is an aventuring moon phase. This is gorgeous. Now, the dial is a wonderful, lustrous white, but the, it's this moon phase that makes the watch. And attention to detail on a watch that is big, bold, a little bit brash, but possessed of beautiful, small nods to the connoisseur is the best of all possible worlds. Now, this one is exceptional because it is both platinum and one of 50 made for the 1995 model year. IWC makes dating and counting easy. So what's inside? Well, it's the tried and true Valshu 7750. The Destriero Scafusia of 1993 that followed this was a manual wind variant of the 7750. This one is a true auto. It's got a perpetual calendar, chronograph, automatic winding, and of course a minute repeater, which I'm now going to fire up. And it's got a, you know, it's got a, a very loud, almost like bell-like sound, which, you know, I, I was playing with it a little bit before the show started, and, you know, I happened to really like the, you know, the, the tone, and there really wasn't that much grinding, which, which you often find with uh, some of these types of, you know, Highly complicated minute repeaters. Okay. So I'm going to do my best, guys, to hit 12.59 on the nose. Give you guys the full, you know, the full exposure here. All right, that's as good as I can get, guys. Yeah, that was a, that was a long moment of silence there. Um, so I hope you guys enjoyed that. Finally, Cartier just spent the last two years, Cartier has been a stalwart of yellow gold, but he just spent the last two years and a fortune buying back and destroying overstocked yellow gold inventory from the Far East. It is not going to make that mistake twice. It is not going to find its way down that path twice. So Cartier is going to be gun shy about making a lot of gold of any description for a while. Given that they're quietly phasing out Cartier fine watchmaking and complications, you're going to be seeing more steel from Cartier in a roughly eight dollars to $12,000 US price range. 
Okay, FP Jorn, hip, but he's made exactly one yellow gold model since he became FP Jorn Montrejorn, and that was one edition of the Vagabondage 1. Finally, supportive minor brands do not have the momentum to pull this off. Alanka Unzona is a brand that is struggling for traction. Langa is going to go for the high percentage play, and since it is steadfastly committed, by the way, that is the ultra rare datagraph in yellow gold, about 30 pieces circa 2008. But Langa is going for the high percentage play. It's going for rose gold, white gold, platinum, and rarely its proprietary honey gold. It is not going to take risk on yellow gold when Langa is already forced to discount out of its own boutiques to move the most appealing precious metal, and the resale value of the brand has arguably never been weaker, despite making the best watches it has ever produced, and I objectively love Langa. But Langa is not going to take a risk on something that's a proven loser in the market. Plus, let's say Longa went gangbusters with Yellow Gold, a brand that makes 5,000 watches. Let's say their production increases by 20%. All of it's not going to be Yellow Gold. So what proportion is going to be? Probably 5 to 10%. So even if Longa had a night and day turnaround tomorrow, Longa would not have the muscle to change the image or the volumes of Yellow Gold in the luxury category. There will be a feature next week on why Longa needs a sports watch, preferably in steel or titanium, but that's next week's feature. Hold that thought. Continuing, the vintage movement often fets yellow gold. Now, you might have thought this would be the savior of yellow gold, but even though vintage loves yellow gold, that's only for vintage watches, as the same retro snobs have not led a resurgence of yellow gold in the new watch marketplace. There hasn't been a hue and a cry, nor have the brands which seem to love vintage reissues broadly assumed the mantle of yellow gold champions. They, they simply haven't gone into the vintage reissue yellow gold realm. Even reissues of famous yellow gold Watches have often come back in white, platinum, steel, or rose. So we're not going to get any help from the vintage movement. They only like yellow gold when it's old. And I would also say this. This is where Vacheron is different and the best hope for yellow gold going forward. Consider this. Vacheron never gave up on yellow gold. Like Paddock, like Rolex. But unlike Paddock and Rolex, Vacheron has room to grow. It remains prominent in the lineup, Yellow Gold does, in Historique as well as Traditionnel and Patrimony, and it's organic to the brand's image. Vacheron comes out with a Yellow Gold watch, and people don't reflexively say, ew, or that's my grandfather's dress watch. VC has room to grow, and here's why I say that. Rolex is at capacity at about 1 million watches. It's smart about constraining supply. We know this because the last three months of last year, Rolex essentially shipped nothing. They have the discipline to stick to a number. Patek Philippe for the last couple of years has been between 50 and 60. They're not increasing that. And Audemars Piguet said it had a five-year plan as of 2015 to make 40,000 watches a year. And based on their residuals, yeah, they're sticking to the plan. Vacheron, on the other hand, makes 25,000 watches a year. And that was roughly what they made in 2017. Which means not only is it smaller than Patek or or AP in terms of volume, but it has room to double its volume while still staying on par with Paddock and AP. They don't necessarily have to outproduce the market to simply be on a volume parity with their main competitors.